Well, it's good to have you here, Isvan, as Thank always. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Mike. Welcome back again. Uh, we're here at the Ritz uh, Carlton in uh, Orlando. I uh, thought we would just um, have a little um, conversation with regard to our upcoming uh, symposium, March 1st and 2nd of 2019, which will be here at the Ritz Carlton again. And that will be preceded by a full day workshop uh, for both of us. We'll each have workshops in the morning and the afternoon. So thought it would be just a good idea to kind of give our um, our uh, viewers a uh, little perspective, a little insight with regard to what we're going to be able to do for those two full days. And you know, as we talked about before in setting this up, you know, we both thought it was kind of a good idea uh, based on our individual track records and and experience level with um, bone augmentation for both horizontal and vertical ridge augs. Uh, we certainly have a lot in common with regard to biology and anatomy, what have you, but we also have some, some nice differences of opinion with regard to uh, protocols and perspective on how we go about things. So I thought it'd be kind of neat to just maybe comment briefly on, on a few items that uh, we'll be covering amongst so many other topics in those two full days. Uh, the first being uh, certainly a lingual flap release that we know is so important to posterior mandibular augmentations where uh, certainly um, I think in general we, we are, well in general uh, clinicians have the most problems with. I think you get the same feedback as I get here in the States right. where in essence if there's a problem you can almost anticipate before the clinician is done asking the question uh, or emailing to you, you know, you can al always anticipate that there's a, an incision line opening and it's certainly because they probably did not even address the lingual flap release uh, element. So with that said, uh, you want to comment a little bit on, on your technique and, and kind of um, how you came about doing what you're doing and I'll do the same. So basically, um I agree with you completely that one, one of the most interesting area and one of the most difficult area would be the mandible, posterior but also the anterior mandible. Sure. And um, honestly when I did my first uh, bone graft in the mandible, I've never done one, I've never seen one. But I knew that the lingua flap has to be advanced. And uh, <clears throat> so very carefully, I had a lot of experience already. I had. Uh, you know, four years in, in hospital training. So um, very carefully advanced my first lingual flap. And then, you know, I started to think about it more and more. And um, definitely, there was only uh, maybe two doctors that I heard are doing this. One was in Europe, Dr. Tinti and Simeon. And in, U in the US, it was you. <laughs> so that's how I, I heard your name first. And, um, <clears throat> but actually, uh, I went home, I moved, moved back to, to Hungary and started to do more like uh, investigations for the anatomy and uh, realized a few little um, aspects. For example, that the, uh, the, the lingual artery, the sublingual artery in the nerve is, is basically protected by nature. It's embedded in the dense connective tissue and there are different zones that you could maybe approach in different steps. And so we developed the technique that is anatomically based and very sound that we call the modified lingua flap. And um, this lingua flap I will discuss in detail, including the anatomy, including why you can do this step safely and how you can do the next step safely. And what happens if you come all the way to the anterior mandible? Because that is also a very, I would say, malignant area. Agree. So Agree. In the, especially in the anterior mandible, if you don't do a lingua flap, it's going to open up all the absolutely, time. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, great. Uh, that's certainly some some interesting background and um, and perspective with regard to how you evolved into doing what you're doing today. Uh, for me personally, it started in 1990 with the um, mandibular tripodial subperiosteal implant. Uh, when I first learned how to do that, uh, I'd gone out to Root Lab in Leewood, Kansas, as I remember. And I uh, realized pretty quickly that with that particular implant, because we're talking itrophic mandibles that were, you know, basically five, six millimeters, seven millimeters in height at most. You almost had the nerve exposed. And in and many, many cases, the nerve is completely dehissed at the crest. So with that said, uh, we've got one shot at closing without tension because otherwise, boom, exposed struts. 
And with that particular implant design, which by the way is a very custom implant, uh, at that time we were doing two-stage uh, surgeries, meaning open up first, they literally an take an impression with custom uh, trays, rubber base impressions. Mm -hmm. I would do two all the time, box them, pour them up, and send them to Root Lab, and then we'd get on the phone and back and forth um, with design, et cetera. Fast forward, now the last 15 years roughly, of the 30 years that I've been doing this uh, implant, still doing it by the way, for selected cases, there's a CAD CAM design of course element. The digital age is here, so in essence we're scanning uh, the patient to start and then creating a stereolithographic model from one of the, one of the um, uh, different companies out there that will do that for us and then in turn Root will design uh, the, the custom implant on that model, which actually it's a replica of the model. They'll take a stone model of that, et cetera. So it's co combination digital analog, but the bottom line is this one surgery. But still, the, the principles are the same, where we open up, place this implant, and then important that we close without tension. So that mitohyoid muscle had to be uh, addressed because without and, that... And on those patients, I'm sure the mitohyoid muscle was attaching on the crest. Exactly. It wasn't more lean. Yeah, and in fact, I'm going to show that rather graphically in even more detail in more videos. But yeah, exactly. So, so right, I mean, it's very... Because that mitohyoid line is literally at the crest. Exactly. So right. when you reflect, right. there it is. So, so it's right there. And uh, the long and short of it is had to figure out rather quickly that um, the release on the facial would not be enough, definitely not. And, and a lot of our colleagues at that time were having dehiscences and incision line opens, openings, etc. So long and short of it, again, I was able to finger dissect that because I was concerned about any sharp dissection. And the long and short of that is, fast forward to the present, here we are, I'm still doing the same thing now almost 30 years later with finger dissection for sure. So it's more of a blunt approach. And, um, but in essence, very similar to, you know, your techniques, uh, certainly uh, the uh, retromyelohyoid retro pad, of course, is almost non-existent in those cases, right. but evolving into our, uh, which for me would be the block rafting in 1990-91, I just pretty much took that same protocol and, and took and it applied to, it. applied it, yeah. So the principles, as you know, whether we're using block, Rid splitting, uh, time mesh, um, titanium reinforced PTFE with particular, whatever the case may be, we're augmenting hip, etc. Flap, um, incision closure. design and flap closure, of course, is, is critical. So, yeah. So, uh, it'll be interesting, of course, as we are able to show in more detail, of course, our respective protocols to the audience um, at that symposium. I think that'll be rather neat for the first time ever. And um, I agree. And will be, I think, very um, enlightening for a lot of folks, I believe, too. Sure. Well, great. Uh, another topic I think of interest to our um, audience would be our uh, respective approach to soft tissue um, in terms of attached tissues after our augmentations. As you know, uh, whether it's anterior maxilla, posterior maxilla, anterior mandible, posterior mandible, in essence, we're left with, after advancement of our flaps, a relative lack of attachment. So um, would you care to comment on your approach using uh, mucoderm for the most part in your strip graft technique? And I certainly will be able to, to comment uh, as well on, on my protocol. So basically, um, <clears throat> yeah, after bone regeneration, you know, once you close the flap, you can get the bone, but quite often you lack keratinized tissue. And I think you also have to look at the mandible and the maxilla in a different way. In the mandible, we don't have, especially in the posterior, we don't have such a you know, deep vestibule to begin with. But of course, we uh, even lose that. So, but I think the mandible or soft tissue graft is not that difficult. However, we're still in the mandible doing something minimally invasive, like microsurgical soft tissue graft. So the patient is, is, is more comfortable, you know, <clears throat> after having the bone graft and implant, we don't want to have do, we don't want to do like a, sure. a big surgery, but still want to get keratinized tissue on the lingual, that to me is very important around those implants and also on the buccal. And then in the maxilla, my main focus in the last couple of years was that uh, if I distort the tissue, sometimes the mucogingiva junction is more palatinal than the implant. Sure. And I need 10 plus millimeters of keratinized tissue because I need the crest plus I need a vestibule. Many of these patients have a high smile line. So if you do an apically positioned flap, you will see several 
centimeters of open wound. I mean, how big of a soft tissue graft are you going to harvest from the palate? I mean, are you going to take the full palate almost off sure. or the half of the palate into a free gingival graft? It's going to be painful, it's going to be ugly. Exactly. So we have developed a technique with utilizing microsurgical strips based on the uh, Hahn and, and Takei article, and then utilizing a collagen matrix, which is the mucograft. But it is in the last years, we also focused how can we get non palatinal looking soft tissues, number one. So I'm going to present that that we, we started to take even less of tissues like micrographs and sometimes from the, from the labial side of the gingiva just to transplant cells. And from these cells we expect that these cells will migrate into the uh, matrix and we can transplant the color and even the stippling, the architecture of the tissue. And then the other focus that I will also uh, present, okay, if I have a patient who's young it's coming with a vertical defect in the anterior maxilla. Needs bone. That bone needs to stay there for 60 plus years. And the patient may not want to have a pontic. <laughs> so let's say missing three teeth, sure. four teeth. Sure. And you want to have single teeth. How can you transplant soft tissues on top of the bone? Number one, how can you do the bone graft that is not going to go away? Number two, how can you, you do soft tissue grafting that you will have a positive architecture, a popular line between the implants, and then when they smile, you will have a, a natural color. So that is, I think the anterior maxilla is very complex and I'm loving that, I'm loving I that. I agree, totally. And uh, that I'm gonna present, and, and what I really like in this symposium is that we're gonna have the time. Yes. So we're gonna really have the time. Yes. I'm, I'm preparing so many videos on Great. this. Great, Great. Also on the buckle flaps, that uh, for example, how do you protect the mental nerve? in a predictable way, exactly. with two patients. One who never had surgery, that's easy. The other one who's gonna to come to you after multiple surgeries, all scar tissue, yes. and around the mental nerve, you have to plaster the tissue in a way that you don't injure anything, and exactly. it's just opening up. Yes. So things yes. like this. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Well, great, so typically your strip graft technique, you're using mucoderm. Uh, it's called correct. mucograft. The mucograft, yeah. yes, mucograft. Um, for me personally, uh, it's been about an 18, almost 19 year journey with, uh, with dermis, uh, Elderm uh, specifically. Uh, I used it primarily um, for a small vestibular plasty to begin with, just kind of experimenting because nobody really had talked experience about it for that before. application. In fact, to this day, quite honestly, I don't really think anybody's talking about it still. Uh, Pat Allen, our, our good friend and colleague, uh, of course, has talked about alloderm for a number of years with regard to root coverage, right. as you know. A closed healing. And, uh, but the closed healing, exactly. And for me, the way I see it, it's kind of all or none. You're either pregnant or you're not. There's no in between. It's black or white, no gray zone. And using alloderm, it's either completely submerged, meaning I'll use it for uh, what I call pre bone graft soft tissue grafting, uh, where sometimes that vestibule is so thinned out, so if we're literally doing our filleting and advancing that flap, we could thin out that tissue enough to we, we could potentially dehiss it uh, in right. the vestibule, and I've right. done that early on. So the long and short of that one is I figured out and realized that, hmm, why not try a layer of this elderm, which by the way comes in varying thickness because of the way it's pure, procured, um, so it's not a uniform thickness, but still, in general, in using it in a closed manner uh, and, and allowing it to heal for almost three months, in general, I will get roughly about a three millimeter increase of thickness of a lamina propria that's not really a true lamina propria as we know it. It's kind of a scar band, it's fibrosed. Uh, I've got nice histo to show on that. but. What is impressive is that it's just another layer of protection, if you will, right. uh, so, that, so, so that you have right more coverage over your graft after uh, doing a split thickness dissection, et cetera, and advancing the flap. So that is submerged, all or none, meaning all closed, again, like Pat with root coverage, or all exposed, which for me would be the vestibuloplasty application. And I've been able to use that quite successfully over all these years in both maxilla and mandible. And what I found quite nicely is that the, the color match is beautiful. Uh, in fact, getting some keratinized gingiva at times will happen, but when it doesn't, which is most of the time, it's still a matted, most importantly, immobilized 
Immobilized, result, yeah. yes. And, uh, and Pat talks about that a lot, uh, Alan, mm -hmm. with regard to mm -hmm. what's keratinized above the surface, below, et cetera. What's, Im what's important, as you know well, is um, that it's, it's immobile, exactly. And what, what I also find interesting enough, when I first heard you talk about your approach, um, you talked about a 50% relapse. Um, I believe shrinkage, a contraction. A shrinkage, right? Contraction, yeah. and that's exactly what I have found over all the years. Yeah. That's very good because that's with alloderm. It's exactly that. so. If we want five to six millimeters of a band, I'll go 10, 12 over. millimeters, yeah. and then watch that just come back almost like clockwork. It's right. impressive. So I too will show that protocol. And um, that's 50 percent is the best you can get because if you do a big vestibular plastic with a free gingival graft, which is like a Full arch. Like a very invasive surgery. Absolutely. Okay. You will get 50%. Yes, okay, So if sure. you get 50% with your technique, we get, we also measure digitally and, and, and also manually. Manually. The contraction, and it was also 50%. That's the best you can get yes. for the big uh, Yes, big for the big ones, right. And we're talking literally two by four centimeter yeah. um, pieces of alloderm where, of course, customizing, trimming, etc. But uh, that's how I really got started is the long, large, in fact, he did mandibles to start, then went to the maxilla, and then smaller segments. But I also found a contraindication for it as well, where you have severe atrophy, for example, in mandible. And there, a free gingival graft has to be done, because I found a 100% relapse with, uh, with elderm, just for the record. So I'll show mm, okay, that yeah. and talk more about yeah. that as well. But mm -hmm. interesting that, you know, again, Different approaches, but yet you know the end result is is very similar and um, and most importantly clinically relevant for for um, our patients. And I think lastly, it might be neat to just talk a little bit about our nasal palatine canal uh, approach with regard to um, what we like to do. I know you like to lateralize that bundle. You've published a nice article on that with um, right. some co-authors, including so basically we include it in the palatino flap with gently. Yeah. Sure, you if you may push it out. care to comment on that just a little bit. Um, so, <clears throat> I was trained to excoclate the nerve. And I did, and, and no patient ever complained, honestly. But then, you know, all of a sudden, when we started to do a lot, of, lot more augmentations, more, a, lot more a lot more severe defects, we realized that when you do the palatina flap, I mean, it's very easy to include it in the palatina flap sure. and just push it sure. in. So we said, exactly. well, number one, there is a nerve, but there's also an arteriola, so that if you don't cut it, then there's better blood supply for sure. the palatino flap. Sure. So then we record the patients, we did a neuro neurosensory testing and questionnaire. Patient reported outcome, I think is very important. Absolutely. If you ask the patient, would you do this again? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> for example. And um, so it was very, very favorable. That's nice. what you do. Nice. Excellent. So, so lateralization of the, of the contents of the canal um, certainly makes sense. Uh, preserving blood supply is always uh, a great thing, of course. For me personally, it's just been from, of course, our Lefort osteotomy days, um, down fracture in the maxilla, inevitably we'd sever that, con that whole, the contents, of course, and, of course. you know, patients every once in a while might complain, of, ah, Doc, you know, my palate feels a little weird, kind of numb, whatever, and in, in a matter of months, they forget about it, if they even think about it at all anymore, et cetera, and, uh, bottom line is it's never been a clinically um, relevant uh, issue uh, in terms of, of, of being problemat problematic to sever it. And to this day, even with our full arch cases, with immediate reconstruction, um, um, meaning, you know, our terminal dentition cases that we're treating with, with immediate placement and immediate teeth, et cetera, um, there are definitely a number of cases where I'll place an implant literally right into, the, mm. into that canal and get good stabilization for a good AP spread. Uh, so, at any rate, you know, we'll be able to compare and contrast once again, I think, on, on that particular topic, which I think is most relevant to, uh, to all of our, our work that we're doing. Yeah. So, I, I think, think definitely we'll, we'll discuss, you know, the posterior maxilla. If you have a, uh, not only a sinus, but also a you need a rejugmentation. Yes, rejugmentation, absolutely. We, we looked at our patients and we realized that one third of, a patient, of the patients need at least horizontal augmentation, if not vertical, and the sinus when definitely, you do that. Definitely. And number two, how you advance the flap in a way so the patient's face is not going to be that big. Exactly. Because that is also the technique for that. Yes, exactly. I'm glad you brought that up because that is so important. Um, because what I have found over time, and again, if you practice long enough and follow your own patients, you, you see trends. And some of them are 
good and some of them are maybe alarming. And for me, I realized rather quickly that the cases where I had a relatively thin um, alveolar ridge, did my sinus graft, loud approach, everything's great, no problem. 10, 11, 12 years later, I'm seeing these folks back and boy, uh, there's um, recession, facial, abutment showing, and where I had lack of attachment, now I've got periimplantitis almost to the person. So I realized rather quickly that um, uh, for sure augmentation would be in order uh, and definitely simultaneous with the sinus graft, yes. And then fast forward to what, five, six years ago or so with Daftari and Bahat showing craniofacial growth happening throughout our lifetime. It doesn't just stop at the growth spurts. And then uh, Bahat himself saying, really, we should augment for more uh, with across the board, including using Elloderm, yeah. which I thought was interesting uh, for him to even talk about that. But bottom line is, you know, we're looking at not so much the two millimeter number that, of course, um, our colleagues have talked about forever. Um, in terms of good aesthetic results for bone and tissue in the aesthetic zone, certainly, um, but but even more so now. So for me, the four millimeter number is makes more sense, and uh, so therefore that's that's the augmentation I look for mm -hmm. uh, across the board, which really does tails into you know crestal approaches that a lot of folks are promoting. I certainly like that too for a number of our cases. However. Um, in, again, situations where we have a width discrepancy, you know, it's really better to do a lateral approach. Your window's there, you can, you're open, of course, with um, surface release incisions, et cetera, and you can address both the arch for, alveolar ridge rather, for right. width and, and height, as well as your, your sinus. So yeah, I think that's gonna be real important that we um, are able to share that with our audience uh, on, on how to do it, and you know, in terms of Diagnostics and treatment planning in general, I think, will be at the heart of everything we're going to be able to showcase for those two days. And I think you'll agree there'll be two action packed days. And as you said earlier, we'll have time to develop our respective protocols so that the audience can really appreciate, probably for the first time in any format, uh, that we have that time to, to show them sequentially how we do things. So they can go back and, depending on their, where that on their learning curve, do it. And I think also it will be a very important part that we show what happens in 10 years. Yes, <laughs> yes, Because that, yes. Uh, you know, you hear so many things. Exactly. And, and so many lectures. And, and, and I, I just look at a picture and I know that that ball is not going to be there. Yeah, exactly. Not 10 years, not five years, in three years. Exactly. And, and I think you just said a mouthful, no pun intended, absolutely, that you know, we each have respective cases that date back so far. And, and just along that, that topic quickly, um, that's why the danger of, of social media can be so uh, deceiving, where we see a lot of posting with folks showing what they did last month, last week, this morning, right now, you know, et cetera. But show me those, case, those cases, show us those cases in five or 10 years. And in fact, better yet, why don't we just have a format for cases that are five or maybe 10 years post prosthetic completion. Let's show those yeah. and see what exactly. we've got. So yeah, I, exactly. I agree. I think that's exactly. gonna be probably at the heart of what we each present, that we have long-term follow-up right. on cases that will validate yeah. what we're doing today. Yeah, I, 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 you know, there's two things. Number one, when I look at my long-term cases, I still learn. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and the, the good thing is that most of the cases have a good way of documentation from the beginning. So I know exactly what I did. Sure, you can pinpoint. And then I look at this. Yeah. You know, first I thought one year, perfect, everything is gonna be perfect. Yeah. Then five years. And the patient is back in 10 years. <laughs> and the patient is back in 15 years. Yes. And then so um, I think this is very important. That I think also when you see a lecture and there's absolutely no follow-ups, that, that, so that can be so uh, frightening. You know, sure, dangerous sure. because maybe even the, the lecturer doesn't yeah. know what's going no, to happen. And, and complications as well. I mean, to, to go everything, show everything and, and, and not even address you know, what, you know, good, bad and ugly. You know, the ugly is there. So we need to, you know, the elephants in the room, we've got to talk about it and show it and, and, and deal with it. And, that, you know, we're human. We have our complications absolutely to this day. You know, for me, 35 years later, are you kidding? Um, and, and in mentoring my own daughter, who's a periodontist that's joined us now a year and 
a few months in practice, you know, I try to tell her, look, your dad still has complications. Don't think, you know, I'm invincible, not even close. And as you said so well, I mean, that's perfect. We definitely learn from our own cases as they come back, absolutely. So I think that's invaluable. Well, quite honestly, I, I think this went as well as we could have expected it to go. Uh, I think we've, um, you'll agree that we've more or less been able to communicate, I think, rather well. Um, I'm really some looking insight. forward to this. What we'll really be able to do, yes, oh, for sure. I really sit through uh, your whole day also. For sure, oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so I we can have also discussion. And and all by that. the way, our, our workshop, which will precede um, the two-day symposium, um, so everybody knows, we'll each have our workshop morning and afternoon. So if anybody wants to attend both, they certainly can do that, or one or the other, whatever they, the case may be. But in that workshop, in since it's preceding our our full two days of lecture discussion, that our audience will, our participants will be able to have the opportunity to really get some insight with regard to pig jaw dissections, et cetera, and see firsthand, even in, in, in some cases, or in some ways rather, in more detail, how we go about our respective protocols for augmentation. So then they can take that knowledge and then the lecture discussion material will, will probably be even more um, meaningful to them. I think, I think after the hands-on, the, the, the video, the surgical videos that we will show, the discussion and the lecture will be much more understandable. Yes, perfect. Okay. He's protecting the mental nerve, but now I know how, because yesterday exactly. he told me how on exactly. a picture, and now I'm reviewing it on a, on a video yes. that I can see. Perfect, perfect, great. Well, thank you. Looking forward to... Um, I'm looking forward to... Three full days, really, of action-packed uh, material and interchange of knowledge, and um, certainly... Um, should be a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Yes, indeed. Thank Thanks. you. It's fun. Thank you.